Welcome, everyone. This is the final session of the Herbert C. Kelman Seminar. Uh, and we are so delighted to have you here with us today. I know for some of you, it's evening. And for some of us, it's middle of the day. And others, it's morning. So wherever you are, uh, welcome. And thank you. Just thank you for taking the time to be with us uh, to hear this very important message that our friend and colleague, Peter Coleman, will be delivering today. Uh, I wanted to just mention that this seminar is co-sponsored by the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and the Program on Negotiation. And my name is Donna Hicks. I'm the chair of the seminar, but we are joined here today by, with James Kerwin, uh, who is representing the Program on Negotiation. And uh, the new managing director, Nicole Bryant, is, uh, is on vacation this week. So we have James here representing uh, PON. And Peter, it's, it's just delightful that you're, you're with us. Herbert Kelman would be, uh, you know, normally he might be on, uh, on, he may even be listening today. He told me that he might just dial in and just listen over the phone. So there's a good chance our Herb will be here with us. But, um, but let me just say uh, uh, for a minute something about the format of the seminar. So Peter will be delivering his talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up for a Q&A. And we ask you to put your questions in the Q&A function, not the chat, because what I'll do um, after Peter's finished is I will read Peter the questions, he'll respond. And I think, um, I think that's pretty much it. James, did you want to say anything before we start? No, just uh, want to welcome everyone. This is our last uh, PON uh, event of the year and last Kelman seminar of the year. And we're so thrilled to have Peter joining us. Great. All right. So um, as you know, Peter Coleman is going to be talking about his new book entitled The, the Way Out how to overcome toxic polarization. And, and Peter is a professor of psychology and education at Columbia University, where he holds a joint appointment at Teachers College and the Earth Institute. Peter directs the Morton Deutsch International Center for Cooperation in Conflict, uh, Conflict Resolution, and is the founding director of the Institute for Psychological Science and Practice. Um, that's not that's not all. He is also the executive director of Columbia University's Advanced Consortium on Cooperation, Conflict, and Complexity. We have a busy man with us today. <laughs> Dr. Coleman has received multiple awards as an expert on constructive conflict resolution and sustainable peace. He's founding board member of the Gaboe. I don't think I said that right. Yeah, maybe I did. Gaboe Peace Foundation USA and a member of the United Nations Mediation Support Unit's Academic Advisory Council. He is a New York State certified mediator and experienced consultant. His current research focuses on conflict intelligence and systemic wisdom as meta competencies for navigating conflict constructively across all levels from families to companies to communities and to nations. And in, this includes uh, projects on adaptive no negotiation and mediation dynamics, cross-cultural um, adaptivity, optimally, optimal something, optimal adaptive negotiation and mediation dynamics. Oh my God, I think I goofed that up, Peter, sorry. That's all right, uh, close. Anyway, it's a lot of stuff. He's doing everything. <laughs> this guy isn't wasting any time in his life and we are so happy to have him. He's written several books. So just so that we'll give you more time with him, I'm not gonna read everything he's written because it's Great. enormous. So just let us welcome our friend and colleague, um, Peter Coleman, and it's, it's all yours, Peter. Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much. I appreciate your introduction and sparing the, the litany of um, information. Uh, Donna's an old friend. We've known each other for a long time, so it's great to be here. Uh, and with everyone that's, uh, that's joining, I'm going to share my screen, if I may, um, and someone will tell, make sure that this is 
can be seen. Let's see here. Oh. <laughs> can we see? Yes, Donna, you can yes. see that? Yes, yes. All I right, great, very yeah. good. Um, right, so this is uh, the Herb C. Kelman Seminar on International Conflict Analysis and Resolution. I believe he, he started this, founded this in third grade uh, in Austria. Um, that's a picture of him for, at that time. Um, and so it's an honor to be here. I'm a, a, I'm a, a longtime student of Herb. I've never studied with him directly, but I followed his work for my entire career been very influential, so it's an honor to be here uh, on this seminar. Uh, and, and as Donna mentioned, I'm going to talk about this book, the content of this book, you know, briefly at a kind of high level. I'll try to give you a sense of it. My, it, this is really a shameless plug for you to buy the book and teach it in your courses if you teach. Uh, but um, I'll spend about a half hour or a little bit more trying to give you a, a, a contours of what this is about um, and. Let me say, so it is about this, what I call toxic polarization, which obviously is a global trend. Um, and there's more and more information on the nature of political polarization, particularly extreme forms of polarization, or what I call toxic polarization, which are patterns, uh, divisive patterns that get stuck in cultures and societies. And so I'm going to talk about what those are. Again, there's much out there on this because we're seeing these kinds of divisions in Latin America, Brazil in particular, in Southeast Asia. Um, India has had periods where it's erupted into intergroup political violence and polarization. Poland, most recently, Bangladesh, Turkey. So this is a, a phenomenon that is present everywhere. Um, but there was an interesting study that came out last year that compared 12 OECD countries on polarization, particularly affective polarization, which I'll define in a second. Um, and they found that, you know, uh, of, of all of these, America, America is exceptional, that over the past 40 years, the distance uh, or the enmity between uh, Democrats and Republicans has grown considerably faster and larger compared to the other 11 nations. Canada, New Zealand, and Switzerland rose to some degree, but not as rapidly and to a lesser extent. In the same period, other nations like Australia and Britain and Norway uh, declined in polarization. So we are in some ways in um, developed nations or more developed nations unique in the degree of polarization. So I'm hoping that like what I talk about today which is focused on the US context, has implications for people around the world who are uh, concerned with these issues. Let me give you a little taste of what is happening in the US right now. This is from a, um, a survey that came out from the Public Religion Research Institute last month, shows about half of Americans report that their extended family is politically more divided today than it was five years ago. 68% of Republicans, believe that the election was stolen from Donald Trump, the last presidential election here. 80% uh, of Democrats versus 16% of Republicans believe that eligible voters are being denied the right to vote. Democrats believe Republican Party has been taken over by racists, while 84% of Republicans believe that the Democratic Party has been taken over by socialists. So this is happening in a context um, uh, that is over several decades um, some of the most concerning information came out in this survey from University of Virginia this fall. It shows that 80% of Biden voters and 84% of Trump voters view officials from the other party as presenting a clear and present danger to American democracy. 40% of Biden voters, 52% of Trump voters favor secession from the union to form their own separate country. 30% of Republicans, and 40% who believe and trust far right news, and 11% of Democrats are today ready to resort to violence to save our country. That's approximately 40 million Americans who stand ready to fight in a country with over 400 million guns, about 80% of them owned by the right. So this is a, this is a particularly acute and difficult time 
it is uh, a time that I refer to as toxic for various reasons. Uh, define what that is and how it differs from more normative or traditional forms of polarization. But I want to stress that we're, we today in this nation are trapped in a, in a decades long trajectory of increasingly tox toxic and hostile political polarization. It's a highly addictive phenomenon. There's research, brain research on this that speaks to the addictive nature of outrage and, and the taste of retaliation becomes addictive. It triggers pleasure centers in our brain. And there's a lot of evidence that it's making us sick as individuals, as families, as communities, in terms of our alienation. Um, and historians like John Meacham have been drawing parallels today with the US in the, in the 1850s, just prior to the US Civil War, because of the secessionist inclinations, the major disinformation campaigns, and the profound contested election, uh, and a sense of electoral distrust and institutional distrust that has been on the decline for decades as well. Today, something like 70 plus percent of us feel that violence is likely in the near future. And unfortunately, our political leaders sit in the epicenter of these divisions, uh, and they often perpetuate them. Um, and so are unlikely to be able to do much to stem this tide. But what I wanna argue is that we can, that civil society, individuals, families, communities have a lot of levers that we can use to bring down the temperature and bring down the heat. Um, I'll talk for a second about why I wrote this book because when Donald Trump was elected, I started to get, I, I run a, a lab at Columbia called the Difficult Conversations Lab where we study moral issues that become divisive and polarizing uh, and the conditions under which conversations around those issues go well or go poorly. And because of that, I, the media started to contact me uh, when Donald Trump's um, inclination to increase political vitriol and rhetoric was becoming more obvious and prevalent. And one of the groups was this group that had started in Germany uh, called, with, with an initiative called Germany Talks and then expanded it to 30 countries and various media organizations. And this was a well-intentioned attempt to bring people together across divides. It's based on contact theory, which many of you are familiar with, the idea that if you never have contact with members of another group, meeting with them, being with them, allows for a humanizing process and shifting of attitudes potentially under certain conditions. So this is a major initiative that was happening um, but what Pew Research has found and uh, I have found and others have found is that this, in situations like today, where we have deep differences in beliefs and attitudes about the other and our own group and the issues that divide us, um, that getting together and having contact with each other leads to a sense of having less in common, more of a sense of alienation and frustration. And so, Encouraging people simply just to get together with people on the other side and talk, if you're a true Trump believer or an anti-Trumper, um, is, is unethical, in my view. Um, and that's one of the stories told by uh, uh, one of the reporters from Die Zeit, which is a, the German newspaper that founded My Country Talks and Germany Talks. He followed these two gentlemen, uh, came here the day after Donald Trump was election, elected, met them both, one is a vet and a hunter, the other is a yoga teacher in Brooklyn. And um, he spent a year with them individually, getting to know them, building relationships with them, becoming friends with them. And at some point he thought, I have to connect these two people because they wanna talk to each other and they're good people, they're decent people. So he did, he brought them together for a breakfast in New York City and they walked in Central Park and had a, good conversation and then decided to go out the next night to go to a, a basketball game and have a couple of beers and talk. And that's when things went bad because someone mentioned Colin Kaepernick. It exploded in what he said, F-bombs. They both got outraged and enraged and left and refused to ever talk to him or each other again. And so my concern was that there were well-intentioned initiatives to try to bridge divides that were not informed sufficiently by science, but what we know about the conditions under which contact helps or maybe harms, particularly when we're dealing with individuals who are 
passionate true believers on any side, um, which can lead to situations like this. So, so I want to what I want to talk about in my remaining time is this idea of toxic polarization. Um, why we're so stuck on this decades-long trajectory, and then and then mostly what we can do about it. That's what the main the main focus of the book that I wrote, The Way Out, is about, is what can be done. I felt that there's good journalistic accounts, there's good science on the problems, the pathologies of, of toxic polarization, but much less about the remedies, about what we do in these situations to pivot, to make adjustments. So let me just clarify the polarization, of course, is just a thing found in science. It's a naturally occurring phenomenon when, you know, systems become charged and then they become attracted to or repulsed by, repelled by two opposing poles that organize a field. And, and in politics, uh, positive political polarization is a good thing. If you have a two-party system, you want to have smart, engaged, you know, individuals on both sides that challenge each other and push each other. And in fact, <clears throat> in the US, there was a concern that there was we were lacking polarization. There was too much overlap in the political parties and their policies. We couldn't sort of distinguish them sufficiently. So there was concern about that at that time, um, but not, you know, the, the idea wasn't to result in a place where we are today. This is an image from Twitter. Red is Republican, Twitter accounts, blue is Democratic. And what tends to happen more and more is this kind of intragroup rumination where Democrats talk to Democrats about them, you know, the other side, Republicans the same, there's very little contact in between them. And if there is, it tends to be, you know, venomous. Um, so uh, here are some of the trends that we see if you measure this phenomenon. One is effective polarization, which is what most people mean when they talk about polarization, and this is like and dislike of the other side. There has been decades of trends of increasing enmity and antipathy towards the other part, members of the other party. Um, and this has been growing, as I said, since really since the 1970s originally. Um, that's when the, we see the initial spike. Um, so there is this increasing sense that of, of contempt uh, and dislike and belief that the other side is stupid and well and poorly intentioned, malintentioned, actively trying to harm the country um, and more warmth and care for our side. So emotionally, we've sort of simplified our emotional experiences, but also um, conceptually, there is a, a, a construct that Pew tracks every year, several times a year. It's called ideological consistency. They measure 10 different issues, policy issues, and where Republicans, independents, and Democrats um, sit in their attitudes on those issues. And what you start to see is the kind of collapse within parties, that their attitudes and issues become highly correlated within political parties, and then divisions between the political parties spread, so that you start to see less and less overlap, but more concerning, is that you see more and more simplification of understanding of these issues. In other words, we're paying much less attention to what are very diverse set of issues like gay rights versus immigration versus um, you know, education policies. Very different opinions are very different issues, but the opinions start to correlate. So we're not paying attention under this kind of tribalism. Also seeing social identity complexity where we see a fusion within individuals of their ideological, religious, racial, and political identities grouping in terms of party or ideological affiliation. Uh, perceptual, perceptual distortions, this is something that more in common has been tracking, which is the degree to which we believe they are more extreme in their attitudes and actions than they actually are, which of course triggers in us a more extreme type of response and reaction. Um, so that's a self-fulfilling prophecy and a feedback loop. There are outside effects of the extreme wings that uh, on Twitter, for example, 80% of the content on Twitter is estimated to come from about 10% of the more extreme voices, the more provocative voices. Um, and so oftentimes it's the more extreme individuals and attitudes that 
control the discourse, which affects our sense of them and what we're facing. But most concerning are two things. One is that we are geographically and virtually uh, sorting into partisan groups. That virtually is taking place, of course, because of the algorithms that are oftentimes used. But geographically, we're moving away from each other physically, not just you know, between rural and urban areas, but also within cities. The New York Times did this piece a couple of months ago showing that you know, in neighborhoods across the country, you start to see these bubbles of blue and red um, and less and less purple um, as Democrats move toward Democrats and away from Republicans and vice versa, which as many of you know, is a recipe for potential violence. When you have large groups of people ideologic with ideological political differences or ethnic differences that live next to each other, but don't have much contact, that's when uh, intergroup conflict is much more likely to escalate and potentially escalate into violence. By the way, I live right here on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in the sea of blue, but across the uh, river for me is are places that are much more purple and mixed. And it's an important thing to know of because we may wanna consider visiting those places. Finally, there are these rises in hate crimes and uh, hate groups and political violence. The years after Barack Obama was elected, um, hate groups in America grew 750%. Under the Trump administration, they grew another 55%. So we're seeing spikes in hate crimes and spikes in hate groups across the country. This is um, uh, from uh, uh, re recent, a recent study on just the trends. And I just wanna point out the sort of far right use of terrorist incidents, as well as the endorsement of violence, the consideration that people would actually feel a need to use violence which since 2017 has spiked. So we're in a difficult phase, but this is part of a long-term trend. This is uh, voting patterns. Uh, this is uh, Nolan McCarty's, McCart McCarty's work. This is voting patterns in Congress and the Senate since 1879 after our US Civil War. And what you see is uh, the lower the line, the less, the, the, uh, the less polarization or the more bipartisanship the higher the line, uh, the more obstructionism and the less bipartisanship, the more polarization. And what we've seen here is voting patterns in Congress. Again, this is, this is they, they track every time that a member of, of Congress or Senate um, crosses the line and, and, and supports uh, policies from the other, uh, put out by the other side. Um, and what we're seeing is a decline in that, an extraordinary decline of that, and it's a multi-decade decline. And these kinds of trends are not just in DC, they're on the ground as well in terms of affective polarization um, and other measures. So a big question that I tried to tackle in this book is why we're so stuck on this runaway train. How did we get stuck? And if you look at the literature or literatures on political polarization, there are many answers to that question. There are micro level answers that, for example, there's a difference in brain sensitivity between conservatives and, and, prog and progressives in that conservatives are much more sensitive to threat and so much more reactive to threat or ethnocentric tendencies or differences in authoritarianism, religious intolerance. You know, there are a variety of more kind of micro level factors that are at play here or that people argue that, that are at play as well as macro level factors. The simple fact that we have a two party system and a winner takes all political system forces people into these kind of tribal ways of thinking every four years or every you know, two years. Um, but government dysfunction and grid gridlock, manipulation by politicians uh, of fear and of outside actors, uh, foreign internet trolls, um, the 24 hour news cycle, all of these factors. So, you know, there's good research on many of these, for example, moral differences between uh, conservative and, um, you know, John Haidt's work uh, on the righteous mind. There's really excellent research on all of these pieces. But what I want to argue is that I, I don't think any of these account for a 50, 60 year pattern. I think what happens is that they start to feed each other. It's when these differences 
start to align within us, between us in the net, our social networks, who we speak to, who we don't speak to, that's when we see these kinds of cultural embedded patterns that systematically pull us apart. It's what I refer to as a super storm of polarization. It is, are these extremely complicated systems that have multiple layers that play on our history of white supremacy, play on our, history, on our current inequality, play on um, changes in the media ecosystems. All of these things are major factors, but it's mostly how they align within us, within our neurological structures, our psychology, our social networks, the media we do and don't, do not watch, some of the broader economic structures, all of these things can contribute together to these systems, which is a type of problem that Karl Popper refers to as a cloud problem. Popper was a philosopher of science and said, we, you know, in science, in life, we face sort of two categories of problems that are different from one another. One are clock problems, which are things like our automobiles and computers that we can kind of break apart and find the thing that's broken and then put them back together. And that has been the dominant problem solving orientation for us for hundreds of years, frankly. So it's something that we're all educated in. But there are other kinds of problems, he argued, and that there are cloud problems. They're unpredictable, ever-changing, highly complex, very hard to control. Um, and this is what we're facing today. This is what I argue. And so we have to think about the problems and think about intervention in a very different way. Um, because one of the things that we believe happens, and this is being uh, um, bearing out in much of the research, is that these kinds of complex patterns tend to settle into, again, deeply entrenched, uh, coherent patterns. Let me give you a, a taste of this. So imagine, if you will, that you're sitting at your favorite local diner. This is in your neighborhood. You love to go there. You sit down to order lunch, and somebody walks in um, who you've never seen before. And they come in, sit down at the counter. And there are many places to sit, but they choose for whatever reason to sit right next to you. And when they do so, they kind of spread out and they, you know, kind of touch your arm and, and sort of own the place, own the space. So again, initially, this is a minor thing. It, it could be meaningless. You don't really have a predisposition to react to them in any particular way. But it does start something. And then as you sit there, you notice how this person treats the waitress and the kinds of food they offer. And then you kind of check out what they're wearing. And suddenly you're starting to connect some dots in your mind, in your emotions, and he's still touching your arm, right? So over time, this kind of grudge can form. And as those grudges form, you start to communicate, even if you don't speak directly, you start to have body language or you, you know, sigh or roll your eyes. You start to communicate a sense of frustration or anger, or disapproval. And that starts to build a dynamic between you and you haven't even spoken to each other yet, right? So you learn that this individual is new to town, is moved to town and comes back to your diner frequently. And so what starts to happen is that, you know, you start to talk to your friends and colleagues and family members that come to this diner and they do the same. And suddenly there's this kind of intergroup dynamic that happens um, that builds over time. And as soon as you start to connect those differences to political differences, oh, so they support them or religious differences or racial differences or any larger symbolic groups, then you start to get into a divisive dynamic that started with someone sitting down and touching your elbow that, that grows into something like this. And of course, this takes place over time, but what it does create for us is an event that ultimately is sort of trapped by a pattern, a biopsychosocial structural pattern of, of events and structures that affect how we view our life. 
and how we experience our life. And these are what physicists call attractor dynamics. These are things that are affected by a complex constellation of things that become aligned and then create patterns that literally attract us. They sort of suck us in to their experiences. I wanna point out that this Tuesday, um, PNAS put out a special issue uh, looking at the complexity dynamics of polarization. So there were a variety of papers that were put out with the study of the problem of polarization as a dynamical, as a complex dynamical system. So there were papers on, you know, spatial polarization, microdynamics, or papers on nonlinear feedback and political polarization, and uh, what this might mean for prevention of polarization of political attitudes um, and tipping points. And tipping points are when people move from one attractor pattern, which is maybe more positive to another. And you see a quick change, but those things are, are conditioned. Those conditions are, are, are sort of incrementally grow over time, but we move into them very quickly. So what I wanna point out is that how we think about this kind of problem of, of, of the intractability of the current state of polarization we're in, and what we ultimately do to change them has to change. Um, and we have been studying for years the dynamics of intractable conflicts, of highly divisive polarizing conflicts. And so there's a, a ton of research on this. And basically the point that we've made is that in our field of peace building, conflict resolution, mediation, negotiation, we oftentimes still think in very linear terms about fixing the clock of a conflict, right? and that there are certain objectives and processes and a role that we have as the expert problem solver going in, and that these kinds of problems require that we think in a radically different way. It's something that I call re-landscaping. It's not dealing with the conflict, it's dealing with the constellation of forces in the context. And understanding complexity dynamics, what we know about complex systems, about when they stabilize and the conditions under which they change, having insight into those and using those insights um, to foster change. I won't go into this in great detail, it's laid out in the book, but I wanna to get to the good news. So the good news is that when you have these kinds of ensconced patterns in communities and families and workplaces, um, there are some conditions where we see them change. And so this is in the study of people like Bill Zartman who say first, if you have a long-term conflict that you're enmeshed in, what helps is if there's a sufficient mass of individuals who are fed up with the status quo. And the good news here is that research by Moore and Common and other groups has found that there is this middle, what they call the exhausted middle majority in America of less extreme, more moderate individuals on the left and the right who are fed up and tired and exhausted, don't want this vitriol anymore, don't want the dysfunction in Washington. We really want a different way. So the good news is that we're miserable, sufficiently miserable as a, as a nation. Um, and they see those that at large numbers. They estimate somewhere between 86 and 93% of Americans, which seems like a lot, but there are more and more that are fed up with the vitriol and the hate and are looking for a different way forward. What another condition that some of the research that looks at when complex systems that are in patterns change is the importance of, of instability, that when there are shocks, political shocks that take place, we see the vast majority of more intractable, for example, example interstate conflicts actually stop and change. Um, something like 95% of long-term protracted conflicts end within some within 10 years of some major political shock that destabilizes it. So again, the good news for us in America now is that we've been shocked by the Trump administration's approach to governing, by COVID and the economic downturn associated with it. There, these are major shocks. As you see in society today, there are 5 million people a month over the past six months that have decided to change their career and to not go back to the work that they used to do. So there is a major time of instability and destabilization, which offers a window for many of us to pivot, but we need a way out. 
We need what ripeness theory says is not only do you need to be miserable, but you need to have some sense of what to do. What is a mutually enticing opportunity for you and them to move forward? And that's really what this book was about. So what the book um, focuses on are five principles from science that I've cherry picked from our research and from the research of many others on what do we know about complex, what do we know about deeply divided societies and the conditions under which they actually pivot and come out of destructive conflict, war or worse? Um, and what are the insights from complexity science that help explain those? And so these are the five pieces of, there are five chapters on this in the book. Um, I'll give you a taste of each. And Donna, you'll tell me if I'm running out of time, but I'm, I'm pretty close. So the first is when you have deeply enmeshed patterns, um, um, one of the things that we find that is necessary, again, is a reset. So we find this with addiction. So addiction as well is a biopsychosocial structural problem. And what you see with addicts oftentimes is some kind of destabilizing factor. They hit bottom, their family intervenes. And then what becomes critically important is what are the first next steps? Do they reach out to a sponsor and go into AA where there's support, where they can start to navigate? So similarly, I would argue that these days of us being destabilized, we wanna think carefully about our next steps, how we engage with members of the other side. It's critically important for the middle to reach out and start to engage with the other side. But the question is, how do you do that in a way that helps? One, one way to be mindful of is the, our assumptions about them and us and change. So this comes out of research out of the Middle East. Some of you may be familiar with Aaron Halperin and others. And what they've found is that when, for example, Israelis um, believe that this situation is not going to change. We're never going to change. They're never going to change. Then they disengage. Or if they have to engage, they fight. But if you actually see, if an Israeli sees a Palestinian talking about their attempts to make peace, to, to find constructive ways forward of changing, if you see them changing their attitudes and their minds and their behaviors, then it elicits in us a sense of the possibility that maybe they can change and maybe we can change. And so it starts to, and this is a basic assumption that they find makes a difference in people's willingness to engage in peace building or promote peace. So it's a basic assumption that is one of the factors I pull out as part of what needs to happen in our, in our reset. Okay, the next thing I will say is that when you're in these long-term cultural patterns, what oftentimes what a lot of research is telling us is that to come in from the outside, have consultants come in or international actors come in to, to you know, repair the divides is oftentimes not the most effective approach. And that you ideally try to first identify what's currently working in the system. This was a um, uh, Laura Chasen, who ran the Public Conversations Project then, um, always talked about when she walks into, when she was in, would be invited into deeply divided societies over some issues, the first thing she would try to say is, where are the networks of effective action? Who's already talking to who across the divide, maybe quietly, maybe in secret, but who's there? Where is the you know, community immune system that's already trying to bridge divides and heal the divides? So part of what I argue is the critical important to start, importance to start there. If this idea of reaching out to the other side is difficult for you, then find someone in your life who you trust who can help you do that. Many families or workplaces have the people that we tend to trust. So reach out to them. But even more importantly is that you could um, you can start to build on these groups because they exist. So there's a group, there's a website called uh, the Bridging Divides Initiative, which is out of Princeton. And what they've done over the past couple of years is map the seven, the more than 7,000 community-based uh, and sector-based groups that are bridge building across the country. It's an interactive map, so you can go to it today and you can click on it and it will take you to your neighborhood. And for example, here's Cambridge. 
And in Cambridge, you see there are a dozen of these groups that are bridge building organizations. Some of them are specifically focused on political divides. Some deal with different types of divides like race, but they're all more informed. And this is what the website has been vetting. Um, they're more informed on the science of bridge building and the conditions under which dialogue or debate or action-based groups are necessary and useful. Um, so th there does exist an infrastructure for peace building and bridge building in this country. And that's the first thing I point to. That's what I've been talking to the uh, My Country Talks folks about is instead of just setting people up and saying, go do this yourself, point them to the resources that exist. Um, let's, let's fill those coffers, let's fill those resources. All right, complication. So this is a critical thing. This has been the center of our research. One of the things we find, of course, is that when you get into intense conflicts like pro-Trump, anti-Trump conflicts or build a wall, don't build a wall conflicts, we tend to oversimplify what are immensely complex things like immigration, which is not about a wall, it's a highly complex set of issues, of interdependent issues. And so if we're in a place where we start to think and feel and behave in highly simplistic way, the best mitigator, of course, is to complicate our lives. Uh, and there are different ways to do that. This chapter lays them out for you, for your family, for your community, and for the nation. But let me give you two quick examples. One is journalists. My colleague, Amanda Ripley, um, wrote this piece for Solutions Journalism a couple of years ago called Complicating the Narratives. And she studied mediators. She came to our lab. She came to, went to John Height's lab and tried to identify what are the kinds of practices that can allow journalists to reflect on how they contribute to polarization, how their business model and how they do their reporting actually encourages polarization because you find provocative ideas, you look for two sides of an issue and extreme voices, and that's what you profile. So what they've been trying to do is think about how could reporters do reporting that is accurate and feasible and you know, economically rewarding enough, but that doesn't contribute either intentionally or unintentionally to our divides. So this is a group that is complicating how reporters do their reporting in a way uh, to benefit the greater good. Um, there are many of examples of this. Uh, maybe I'll move on because I think I'm out of time, but there, I wrote a piece in the, in the Hill about the, the, the um, Newt Gingrich's Gingrich's decision to, to change the work week in Congress from five days to three, tell, tell his, his um, uh, cohort not to move to Washington to stay home, keep their families at home. And therefore they lost the cross-cutting structures that had been there for hundreds of years um, and, and basically removed that kind of social contact that would exi was existing that was a buffer to the, to the um, intense enmity that we now see in Congress. Right, two, two more points. This is a relatively new point. It comes out of neuroscience research. Um, and it's something that is somewhat provocative for the peace building negotiation mediation world because we're keen on bringing people to a table and having them sit to each other and talk through problems, which for the vast majority of problems works. But when the problems are deeply embedded in our neurological structures, so we can't process certain things or the emotions are so intense that it, it's just too difficult to bring people together. One thing we're learning from neuroscience is the power of physical movement, the power of getting people up physically, moving together, ideally side by side, outside with disputants um, and, and the power of that to help people synchronize and feel a sense of compassion, um, cooperation with each other. It's something of a secret weapon that has been applied, is being applied more and more in peace building initiatives. So it's not just dialogue, but it's then moving them into action together to take on things that they can take on. So there's an entire chapter on this as well and the value of movement, of physical and psychological movement for building flexibility and connection across divides. But the final thing I'll say is the hardest thing I'll say, which is that there are no, you know, this is a 50, 60 year trajectory that we're in. 
there are many factors co contributing to it and keeping it in, this, in the status quo. There, there are no short fixes to this. This is going to take sort of adaptive work. Um, and the, this is the book, The Logic of Failure, which Dietrich Dorner is a German psychologist wrote, who argues that there's probably more harm done by well-intentioned people like us who are not mindful of the unintended consequences of what they do. Um, but what he does study is the, the kinds of decision-making processes that people make that are actually better at managing complex environments. We've done studies on this. This is the Israeli-Palestinian peacemaker game, highly complicated game, very easy to fail at. But people that have certain competencies around co integrative complexity in terms of how they think, emotional complexity in terms of being able to hold contradictory emotions, behavioral complexity, there's, they, they evidence certain kinds of decision, uh, um, competencies that allow them to navigate more complicated problems uh, more effectively. So I summarize the research in this chapter, and I talk about what this means for playing the long game, that what we're doing is going to take time, and there are no quick fixes. And the idea that you can bring people together for an hour who either hate each other or are true believers and, and you know, living in uh, opposing media ecosystems is highly problematic. We have to sort of push ourselves to recognize the realities that we're facing. So the book ends with a set of rules that I won't go through, but they are basically essentializing the steps that you could, the nudges, the adjustments that you could make in your life if you found yourself triggered. And they're all informed by the chapters that, that preceded them. Um, and there's a website, The Way Out, uh, which has exercises, media, talks, interviews, all kinds of information on that. Um, but the most important recommendation I could make is read the book and then reach out to me and let's talk about it. Um, because I think this is a critically urgent time right now before the next election, before January uh, 6th and 7th in this country, and then the next two election cycles. This is the time that we need to sort of work together. Okay, Donna. Wow, Peter, thank you so much. There, there was so much there and so much- Guns are blazing. I, I came out with a lot. Guns are blazing, yes, my goodness. And we've got some, some really uh, great questions too. Great. Um, this, this one, talk about immediate urgency. Lars Ho wants to know, there seems to be some friction on the border of Russia and U Ukraine at the moment. Any thoughts, any reflections about how to approach this solution? Uh, between Russia and Ukraine or the yeah. U.S.'s role in that? Well, you can put, add that too. Yeah, well, of course, this is a crisis situation. I, uh, uh, and this is not, uh, it's not necessarily an, it's an incident in an long-term long protracted conflict between two nations or multiple nations at this point. Um, so there's a lot to say, but it, it, it's a, you know, that's a particular military crisis. So certainly the short-term implicate, the short-term strategies have to be about security, have to be trying to understand the realities of Putin's decision-making process in this. Um, and it's a, it, again, it's a highly complicated set of issues. There is the long-term issue. I mean, the relationships between, for example, Russia and the US, are an interesting example of attractor dynamics over time because there was the Cold War and then the end of the Cold War and the kind of warming of relations, but the, the potential for destructive relationships continued, right? And, and now has recaptured the system. What that means is that the, the, the long-term structures of what driving these divisions have to be seriously attended to in ways that perhaps they weren't um, in, uh, in, you know, sufficiently in the interim. So I don't have any solutions for that situation. I think it is something that's, you know, an extremely dangerous time. Um, but what I'm trying to argue again is the, the need to understand both short-term interventions and the long-term implications and consequences of those. And I think in, in, in Russia, Russian American relations, we haven't sufficiently attended to those. Yeah, that's a story to be continued for sure, Peter. Um, there's so many questions. I'm just going to kind of randomly choose some. This is from right. John Saruf. Um, 
he is, I, I believe John is with the Public Conversations Project. I know there's a new name to it, but here's his question. This is exciting work, thank you. As I think about intervention levels, the family unit feels too small to make a difference. The nation or even a state feels too big. At what level of intervention or size of a group or community do you think is most impactful yeah. and possible for your work or for our work? So yes, if, it, if, um, if he is a member of uh, what was Public Conversations Project is now Central Partners, I start the book with uh, uh, an uh, example of the work of Laura Chasen and Susan Podziba in their negotiation or their facilitation of a long-term dialogue process there. Um, so big fans of that group. Um, and I think that's an, actually an interesting case, that particular Boston uh, uh, dialogue over abortion because it was a community leaders on, on both sides of the divide. And it was uh, a community-based organization, uh, you know, Public Conversations Project at the time that facilitated that. But the nature of their process, which was a long-term process and a challenge, very challenging process, was transformational, not just for the engagement of the leaders, but in how they conducted their advocacy. And some would argue and believe, I've studied this, this particular case for a long time, that it had implications nationally. Right, that it really affected the discourse. It affected the level of vitriol and hostility because a lot of it had been coming out of Boston before this time. So what that was, that's all to say is, you know, I, I think we shouldn't underestimate the effects of, you know, this is what Margaret Mead said, of a handful of people to make major pr profound changes. These people happen to be respected community leaders in their own communities. So they had currency, you know, as Herb Kelman knows this because of his problem solving workshops and working with mid-level influentials. That can be a very powerful space to work if it's transformational. And if, that tra if the transformations that happen between people in these conversations ultimately play out in their spheres of influence. So, but you know, what I'm arguing, I've just finished writing a piece today, which is saying that the government is not in a position to do this. Community-based organizations are in a better position to do this, but it is really ultimately on each of us, particularly if we're more moderate, more moderate middle individuals, we need to re-engage in our de democracy here. We become passive, passive observers, frustrated, disgusted, and disengaged, and that's not, no longer acceptable. It is on all of us to step up that has to happen first and look for those groups and organizations in your community that can help you do that effectively. Yeah, we all need to take responsibility. Um, it's an interesting question here. Just um, wait a second, oh, it just flipped. Um, okay, can you speak to the role of trust in institutions, which is declining, yeah. as well as Michael Sandel's assertion in the tyranny of merit that the widening income and wealth gap um, in the wake of globalization is the underlying cause of social tensions and polarization, especially among those without a college education and who are often looked down upon. Yeah, so trust is critical and the decline in institutional trust is a major factor uh, which has been you know, alive and feeding the left and the right, right? The Bernie Sanders group is, angry, the, you know, the pro-Trump group is angry. And a lot of it is because they don't trust the institutions and policies that these leaders make. So it's a major factor as inequality is. I, 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 and, but you know, I, I have to say there are, there are foundational factors like our legacy of white supremacy in this country, right? That is still alive and well. Um, and uh, the, me the media, the internet, right? The like button, you know, the 2002, 2012 changes that took place in our media ecosystem, in our social media. There are major factors, but they're not sufficient to explain where we're at because other countries have similar kinds of challenges and are not in this place. It is how these things feed each other. And that's what we have to sort of understand is it's not any one thing, you know? John Haidt's work on, on, on moral differences, moral value differences is really important work, but it's insufficient to explain this pattern. We have to understand how these things work together and then figure out remedies 
to address the pieces, but ultimately in a way that's understanding of the whole, of how the whole comes together and settles into these patterns and how do we break those patterns? That's what I'm trying to speak to. Yeah, great, thank you, Peter. Um, here's another one from Mong Nayo. I hope I pronounced her name or, or his name correctly. Having different views or opinions is expected in a society and is a sign of strength in a democracy. However, the question is why increase in violence as of, as of in January 6 um, events and or acceptance of violence response against people who have different views? Where did that come from? And how can Americans promote a culture where violence is totally unacceptable, even if you have completely opposing views? And what role narratives play in that, if any? Well, so there are a lot of pieces to that question. I guess I'll pick one, um, which is, I, I think the role that we can play is what our colleague Bill Urey would argue is the third side, and that is our role. Um, and that is our role of, you know, again, if you think about say 86% of Americans being ready for change, that means that there are friends and neighbors and coworkers of those that may choose violence that can resist that can push back, that can discourage them, can, that can challenge them. And those are the people that they'll listen to. They're not gonna listen to me. They're not gonna listen to Joe Biden. So I think that it is incumbent on this middle majority to step up and not just reach out across the divide, but also speak to members of their own community that are particularly extreme, potentially dangerous, and to sort of work with them to try to bring the temperature down. They have that kind of latitude where you can't get intergroup intervention or top-down intervention in those situations. So, so again, you know, it, to me, it does go back to the main theme, which is that we all have a role to play. Sometimes it's just within our own groups. You know, I think there's you know, a lot of us that are on the progressive side that have been trying to have conversations with progressives about, this doesn't mean you embrace white supremacy and you give up the fight. This means you reflect on what are you doing to contribute to the potential of violence? And is there a way to decrease that potential? So it is working within our own communities as well as across the divide. Yeah, I'm just, this, this, there's one uh, last question that is yeah. simple and profound at the same time. And I, I'd like to see how you'd answer it. Yeah. This is by Frederick Dulles. Please explain why the hunter and the yogi, the relationship exploded. Why did it explode? Well, on one level, there were psychological issues involved, uh, father issues on one side, um, and, and, and how particularly the issue of Colin Kaepernick, the military, and what he was trying to do in his protest triggered deeper things. But on another level, there were mistakes made about how they were brought together. The lack of facilitation, the lack of an idea of a structure of a process where you anticipate that, right? So there were problems with the process. It was a well-intentioned encounter. This man had good relations with both of them, but he didn't really think through what happens if I bring them together late at night, we have a couple of beers, and then somebody mentions Colin Kaepernick. It's a, it's, you know, for, for many vets, it's a, it's a very, it's a highly triggering issue in different directions. So not being mindful of that um, and, and being seduced into thinking, oh, we're all just friends here. We can talk about these things is a mistake. So the reason that they blew up had something to do with their own psychologies and their own histories and relationships. But this was a new nascent encounter with somebody from the other side and they stepped right on a landmine and there was no anticipation for it and no backup. Uh, and that's unethical um, and it's something we should all try to avoid. Right. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Um, this, was, this was such an enlightening 40 minutes with you here. And I'm, I, just, uh, I just hope that all of us will um, hear your call and just start taking responsibility no matter how big or small it is i mean we just have to start that's that's our our job so thank you thank you thank you it, it's possible people are doing it across the country across the world i'm i'm going to be um using your optimism in order to uh get myself moving as well so thank you peter and um 
I wanted to say that the, this session is, re, uh, is being recorded, so it will be available uh, on the PON website after Christmas, uh, after the holidays, actually, um, probably the first week of January, because we're, everybody's on vacation for the next couple of weeks. So check in um, after the first of the year. Uh, and I'd also like to give uh, uh, James Kerwin a, a minute to um, just talk a little bit about some upcoming events at PON. So again, Peter, it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful time spent with you. And James, take it over. Thank you, Donna. And thank you so much, Peter. Uh, there's quite a lot of work to do, but uh, you've really given us uh, hope that we can use our own leverage to find a way out. So thank you for this talk and thank you for the book. I look forward to reading it. I also want to thank our audience. Uh, there were lots of great comments and suggestions in the chat, and I think that's what makes these uh, presentations so valuable as well. So thanks. I want to thank the audience for their participation. Uh, but also want to give uh, a heads up to some of the events that we have planned for 2022, because as I mentioned, these are uh, this is the last event of 2021, but in um, January 12th, we'll have Anthony Juanis St. John of American University talking to us about lessons learned and forgotten from the uh, evacuations of Saigon and then Kabul. That will be a powerful presentation. And uh, you mentioned Susan Paziba, who was uh, on with us in this session. She is going to be joining us on January 20th to talk about civic fusion and the hidden connective energies of conflict. Uh, PON is also offering one day executive education seminars with a whole host of our faculty like William Yuri, Dan Shapiro, Guhan Subramanian, and Mike Wheeler. So uh, we just always encourage you to go to our website, pon.harvard.edu, to learn more and to stay connected with us. Uh, there's going to be plenty ahead in the new year. So in closing, I just want to wish everyone a happy new year. We look forward to seeing you again in 2022. Take care, everyone.